Hi everyone, thanks for coming out today. It's good to see all of you. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott G. Edgington, uh, who is a planetary scientist at JPL, whose research specializes in giant planet photochemistry and atmospheric structure, radiative transport in atmosphere and ring systems, and spectroscopy. He is Cassini's deputy project scientist and investigation scientist for Cassini's composite infrared mapping spectrometer. He has most recently been selected as the investigation scientist for the Europa Ultraviolet Spectrograph on the Europa Clipper mission. He received his undergraduate degree in engineering physics from the University of Pittsburgh and a PhD in atmospheric and sci in space science from the University of Michigan. So with that, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Scott Edgington. Thank you. Wow, more people than I expected. <laughs> Welcome. Well, Cassini speaks for itself. Uh, 13 years orbiting Saturn, uh, just an amazing wealth of information and data that Cassini has brought back. To uh, begin, uh, we'll, uh, the namesakes of Cassini are these two famous astronomers, Giovanni Delmonico Cassini and Christian Huygens. Uh, Huygens, uh, Christian Huygens uh, discovered Titan and the true nature of Saturn's rings. They weren't ears like Galileo thought they were. And Cassini is, of course, uh, named for, and the namesake for the spacecraft itself. The Cassini division is named after him, uh, after he discovered it. And he also discovered several moons of, of uh, Saturn. So this is the Cassini orbiter. It's about two stories tall. And here's uh, some humans right here. So you could gauge uh, uh, how, how big the spacecraft actually is. Uh, in von Karman, if you have ever, ever been to JPL, von Karman has the half scale model of Cassini. And the California Science Center actually has the only full scale model of Cassini. Uh, it's ha hanging up in the atrium as you go up the escalators there uh, on your way to the exhibits. And then uh, as part of this mission, uh, we, uh, we uh, took the Huygens probe, which is uh, a probe that was designed to land on Titan's surface after floating through the atmosphere on a parachute. And uh, that was given to us by ESA uh, as, uh, as a means to fund the Cassini project and get it off the surface of the Earth. <laughs> so here's some specs. You can read them uh, for your enjoyment. So uh, Cassini took off uh, in October of 1997 on a seven-year cruise to the Saturn system. You might have 15 seconds. And here's a video of the launch. But getting out to Saturn took seven years because we needed gravity assists from the various planets. Uh, we had uh, several uh, Venus flybys, an Earth flyby, Jupiter flyby, and eventually Saturn. Now, I wasn't at the Cape at this time because I was, I was defending my PhD. <laughs> and I'm told that by those uh, at the launch, uh, once it got into this cloud, all of a sudden you see it brighten up and then you think that's okay, something's wrong you know, here. But as soon as it broke through that upper uh, cloud, everyone knew that we were on our way to Saturn. So I will stop that there. So this is our timeline. So it took seven years to get out to Saturn. We got to Saturn when the uh, southern hemisphere was in, in summer. Uh, so, and we had a four-year prime mission from 2004 to 2008. Uh, we were so successful that we argued for a, uh, uh, another two-year extension, and we got that extension. And so that took us through the equinox. So this is at Saturn's equinox. And uh, for reference, it takes about, uh, 29, about 29 years for Saturn to orbit uh, around the sun. So, uh, so that's seven years plus this uh, uh, six here you know, is you know, not quite half, but uh, getting there. 
Uh, and then after the Equinox mission, we were granted an extension, a seven-year extension called the Solstice mission. And the goal was to get us out to Solstice. And Solstice is coming uh, next month. Uh, actually, no, it's this month. Uh, <laughs> so uh, soon summer will be uh, occurring in, in uh, Saturn's northern hemisphere. And unfortunately, Cassini, it's uh, near the end here in this uh, green box that we're calling uh, here it says proximal, but this is called the grand finale uh, to most uh, folk out there. And I'll tell you soon about these uh, sets of remarkable sets of orbits uh, that we uh, have. So little Saturn basics here. Uh, if you took Saturn and put it between the Earth and Moon, it would fit nice and cozy uh, in, in that gap. Wow. So this is two scale. So. Obviously, the Earth probably wouldn't exist because we'll probably be torn off by, by uh, Saturn. And uh, the rings of Saturn, uh, they were named in terms of, in the order of their discovery, A, B, C ring, D ring, E ring, F ring, and G ring. Obviously, the uh, A, B, C rings you could see from uh, the surface of the Earth. Uh, the other rings, uh, you have to be there with spacecraft. Uh, up close and personal to, to see those rings. What do we do in the Saturn system? We study all of it. Uh, we study the planet itself, and, and here you're st studying storms in the, in the upper atmosphere, you're studying the interior of Saturn, uh, we study the rings of Saturn, and then you have all these nice uh, satellites uh, orbiting Saturn. Uh, Enceladus, I'll tell you a little more about this later. And of course you have the biggest moon, Titan, which uh, was a big driver for Cassini early on. Uh, you know, one of the goals uh, of the Saturn mission was to go and study Titan. Uh, after Voyager, we had discovered that Titan was shrouded in this haze and you know, we really couldn't peer through the surface. But we knew that from Voyager that it had an interesting uh, nature to it. It had a nitrogen atmosphere, it had uh, hydrocarbons in the atmosphere, and it was any, anyone's guess as to what's happening underneath that shrouded atmosphere. So that was a, a, a huge goal of the mission, and, and still is today, to study uh, Titan, uh, which is a very Earth-like world. So in our many years orbiting Saturn, 13, uh, uh, nearly 13 now, uh, you know, we, we've fly, flown by Titan over 120 times, uh, 127 times to be exact, and we just had our final Titan flyby uh, on October, uh, I'm sorry, April 22nd. So that would be this one. And it's uh, kind of remarkable seeing people count down the number of Titan flybys uh, as we uh, get to the end of the mission. And also, we've studied the other uh, bodies in the, solar sy in, in the Saturn system. Uh, Enceladus uh, became a huge uh, goal of the extended mission and the solstice mission. And the reason for that is because we discovered plumes of water ice just coming from this uh, moon, uh, which made uh, for interesting study. And so our solstice mission and equinox mission we really added a lot of uh, flybys of Enceladus to, to learn as much about it as possible. So, so the more we learned, the more we tweaked our, our orbits, our science, to focus on certain uh, air, uh, regions. And then, of course, we've studied all these different moons of, of the Saturn system, Dione, Rhea, et cetera. And now we're in this phase. So these are the orbits we've been in for the last seven years. If you fold in the uh, orbits from the six years previous, this would look like a knotted ball of yarn. Uh, we've just been everywhere in this system, uh, near and far, uh, looking at moons, uh, Titan, the either icy satellites, the rings, Saturn itself. And then, you know, the reason why you want to get into these other regions around Saturn is to study the magnetic field that, that uh, surrounds Saturn, which is, uh, which is huge. Not as big as Jupiter's, but, but huge in itself. 
So now we're in this set of orbits, uh, highlighted in the uh, tan color. And let's blow them up. So since November of last year, we've been in uh, this set of orbits. Uh, from November to April, this gray set of orbits. And we call this our ring grazing orbits because these sets of orbits bring the periaps in close to the F ring. Uh, we've never been this close to the rings of Saturn before. And uh, you know, so we're just grazing the outer edge of those rings. And we did that 20 times. Now we're in this set of orbits that we're calling the grand finale orbits, 22 in all. And uh, this is unique in the sense that it takes us right through this gap uh, between the planet and the rings. This gap is about 2,000 kilometers uh, wide. That's slightly smaller than the um, width of the United States. And of course, our final orbit is this orange orbit. So November 30th, we began our ring grazing orbits. And you can see we, uh, in longitude, we actually covered a good portion of the planet uh, in longitude, planet and rings. On April 22nd, so this is our final uh, orbit of the ring grazing. See, we come in, just go beyond the rings there. And then Titan is coming up here. You can see Titan there, and bam. And that tweaks us just enough to put us on the, our grand finale orbits. Right through the gap. And that happened on April 26th. So we made history. And here you can see we cover a good bit of longitude uh, with this set of orbits too. So on the night of uh, April 26th at midnight, we were actually at the lab uh, uh, waiting for that radio signal to come down. Uh, the, uh, we, we executed the, the, the periaps. We went through uh, periaps, but we oriented the spacecraft such that we protected ourselves. Uh, and then scientists wanted to get back to doing science. And so uh, 22 hours later, we had our first downlink. So imagine the time that it went through here all the way as Cassini was traveling outward, 22 hours later, you, we did not know what happened to the spacecraft. And so you're sitting there eagerly, you know, waiting for that signal. And uh, the whole uh, group uh, inter erupted in joy once you saw that carrier come through. And then uh, on September 11, we're going to, you know, Titan will get close enough, just a tiny little bit closer. Uh, to us, and that will nudge us onto our final orbit that will take us right into the planet for a September 15 impact. So here's what one of those, if you were sitting on Cassini, here's what you would see. To go from pole to pole takes about an hour. We're tra uh, traveling at 77,000 kilometers, kilometers per Second, just remarkable. I could watch that all day. <laughs> so, uh, so why are we doing this? Uh, this set of orbits. Uh, obviously, it's uh, you know all the, we have all this unique science, and I'll tell you about it uh, in a, in a bit. But uh, the real reason why we have to do this set of orbits is that we're running out of fuel. Uh, we've used up most of our fuel that we use to control us as we fly by Titan, make our corrections to get us to our next, next de destination. And uh, when we got to Saturn at, in 2004, we used up half of it just to get into orbit. And since then, we've been using that fuel. And so now we're out of gas. Uh, but we're also the victim of our own success. Uh, and I say that because We've discovered things in the Saturn system that have literally changed the paradigm for where we look for life. Uh, these are 
uh, new places to explore, uh, what NASA is calling ocean worlds. And uh, uh, one of those uh, places is Enceladus, and the other is Titan. Uh, now, of course, we knew Titan was interesting, but we didn't know that Titan was so interesting until we got there. We landed the, the Huygens probe, and we saw our first inkling of what the surface looks like. Uh, imagine when, when the probe is falling into the atmosphere, you're seeing uh, all these river channels and, and lakes, lake beds and um, beachheads, and you're, you're saying to yourself, wow, something's, uh, there's active geology here. There's liquid that has flown on this surface, or uh, f that flowed on this surface at one point in time. And with Enceladus, kind of early on in the mission, uh, we had known about these tiger stripes from our early images. And you know these are cracks in the surface of Enceladus. And we also know that Enceladus is sitting in this uh, huge E-ring, uh, <laughs> basically a ring of icy particles. But we, we speculated, scientists speculated, but Cassini found plumes of active uh, jets of water being coming out of the southern pole of Enceladus. So now we know that this, uh, these active jets go on to form the E-ring that Enceladus sits in. But that's, that's just one aspect. As you fly through this plume, uh, you measure the gravity, you measure the, uh, the uh, effect of the uh, particles on its surroundings, so you're measuring the magnetic field. Uh, you're also detecting molecules that you're flying through and particles that you're flying through. And so soon after, we learned that, OK, there has to be, from gravity data, uh, a pocket of water uh, underneath the south pole of this moon. But it took us uh, several more years to come to the conclusion that this uh, pocket of water is actually a global ocean. So with Enceladus, you have the icy shell, the exterior, and then you have this uh, uh, liquid water ocean. Uh, otherwise, you can't explain the gravity data or the libration data that uh, Cassini has observed. Uh, so you need that liquid water ocean. But even more interesting, we've discovered evidence of geothermal activity. Basically, by what we by flying through this plume, we detected silica, SiO2, which is basically grains of sand on the beach, uh, but tiny, tiny grains of sand. Uh, we've detected that. We've detected excess methane in this plume of material. And just recently, we announced that we detected hydrogen, uh, mole molecular hydrogen, in this uh, plume of material. And, uh, and the only way you get these three things uh, is if you have a rocky core where it's hot enough uh, to interact with the water. Uh, and you know, think of uh, boiling water at the surface of this uh, core. And so we know that there's activity generating chemistry, generating the uh, molecules that we are detecting. Enceladus is literally giving out free samples to us. We've also discovered other organics in the plumes, and we also have detected salts in the plumes. So there's a lot of evidence that there's interesting things going on inside of this moon. With Titan, of course, we, we've discovered over time that Titan has liquid methane lakes. And uh, uh, we've been monitoring these lakes uh, over the years, looking for changes on the lakes. Uh, by, and Looking at those changes, you're learning more about the, the uh, climate of Titan. And uh, who knows what happens uh, could happen uh, in, in these lakes. Uh, maybe they might have harbor some sort of methanogen uh, uh, as a uh, life form. And then uh, with our cameras, we could peer through the haze of, Saturn, uh, of Titan and uh, actually detect uh, clouds. Uh, uh, in uh, Titan, and these are recently detected clouds a few months ago. And then just recently, we had a huge burst of clouds. So uh, the uh, weather activity is uh, heating up on, on Titan as we near summer uh, solstice. 
So it's an active system, interesting chemistry, uh, a unique chemistry with uh, methane replacing water. But because of these two bodies, we have to protect them. Uh, we can't basically just leave Cassini you know, free, freely orbiting uh, to uh, encounter whatever bodies in May. Uh, we have to protect these. So uh, th I, I guess around 10 years ago, we started talking about this idea. You know, what are we going to do uh, with, uh, with Cassini uh, as we go further towards solstice? And uh, there were various options. And one option was, OK, let's kick it out of the Saturn system. Uh, this is when we had enough fuel to do so. Uh, and maybe go visit Uranus. Uh, there was a study that it would take uh, uh, another five to seven years to get out to uh, Uranus, depending on uh, exactly when you kick Cassini out of the system. Uh, there was an, also a uh, proposal to put it in an orbit where it won't encounter anything for about 500 years. Well, that's kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, if you're not encountering anything, uh, you're just you know, there floating around uh, uh, detecting magnetic field particles and maybe solar wind, uh, but you're too far to observe anything of interest. So, uh, uh, and then we found out about this option where the uh, navigators came, came to us and said, hey, we got this great uh, end of mission and uh, you got to you know, see uh, what it is. And when they explained that we, they could actually put the spacecraft into this gap, you know, all the scientists, all their eyes lined up, uh, or uh, lighted up. Uh, it was just amazing to see uh, the joy uh, that <laughs> uh, in their uh, eyes. So that brings us to uh, where we are now, basically. So uh, we've been getting closer and closer to Saturn over time. We've been observing uh, the weather systems of Saturn. And I'm sure you've heard of the famous hexagon uh, in, near Saturn's North Pole. It's basically a jet stream, a six-sided six jet stream. Uh, all the planets have jet streams, including the Earth. Uh, ours tends to be anywhere from five to eight, depending on uh, uh, the weather conditions. Uh, and of course, you have land and sea that uh, kind of messes it up and prevents it from taking on a nice geometric shape uh, like you see here on Saturn. Uh, we still don't know exactly what uh, drives it. Uh, you know, here on Earth, uh, you have uh, water playing a big role. But here on Saturn, uh, uh, at this time, you know, we do not know exactly what's driving it. But uh, we're getting close views of of this hexagon in detail. And imagine watching these clouds just go around these corners. Uh, so Cassini uh, has several observations uh, upcoming to look at that behavior, see how these uh, storm systems uh, flow with, uh, uh, with the hexagon. We've seen changes over time. Uh, before solstice, before, uh, uh, or shortly after equinox, uh, the hur the uh, hurricane came in view of sunlight, and this whole region was relatively hazeless. And uh, last year, uh, this image was taken where you could see it's filling up with hazes. So as, t as the sun has rose over the North Pole, more and more hazes have built up over time. And so we're uh, keenly uh, looking to see how uh, this area forms. And right now, it's almost filled with uh, the hazes, except for the hurricane region. Um, so it'll be interesting to study uh, that over the next uh, few months. We've looked at the rings in detail. Uh, so this is the Keeler Gap, which is a small, narrow gap. Uh, uh, this is Daphnis. It's about five kilometers in uh, length, uh, uh, or diameter, I should say. And, uh, and so the gap isn't too much bigger than Daphnis. And as Daphnis flows through this gap, clearing the gap, uh, you could see it generate waves due to the gravi gravity that, um, that it's exerting on the surrounding ring particles. So literally, the, the moon comes along. The ring particle sees, sees that the uh, gravity is increasing and travels towards the moon. 
And so, uh, and then the moon keeps going because it's going faster than those particles and just leaves them behind. And you could see this wave just damping out uh, as it goes by. And then you have a similar wave on this side of, of Daphnis. So here's another close up. And if you look closely, if you could actually see some material that it's pulling off from this uh, wave. And you could kind of see a skirt of material. So there's some speculation that this material will eventually end up coating the surface of Daphnis. We've looked at the rings in gory detail uh, uh, during the uh, um, uh, ring grazing orbits. And these are some of our closest images of the rings. You could see a lot of structure uh, in this image here. And, and you know, the, it's like the closer you get, the more and more detail you see in, this, uh, in these rings, sort of like fractals. Uh, it's just really interesting. We haven't gotten close enough to see an individual ring particle. However, uh, we are seeing clumps of ring particles. So uh, uh, it's really exciting uh, to see the scientists, ring scientists uh, 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 excited about these images where you see all this structure. Some of the smaller than Daphnis, on the order of, say, about a kilometer in size, maybe half a kilometer in size, are what we're calling uh, propellers. And so these are structures that we've seen since, uh, since we got into orbit, uh, but now we're seeing them closer. And they, they're called propellers because they kind of look like propeller-like structures. Central object, and it looks like a, you know, a two uh, props of the propeller. Uh, and these are basically doing the same thing that Daphnis is doing. Uh, you have material at the core, about a kilometer, half a kilometer in size, which is gathering material, and it is interacting with the rings around it. But also, these, these particles are small enough such that the rings themselves could in interact with the uh, body itself. So there's a competition for uh, who's in charge so to speak. And uh, so they want to, it's clear that you know, they want to open gaps in the rings, but they're just not big enough. Uh, and so and, uh, we've identified uh, bunches of them. Uh, there's uh, even more recent images with uh, a lot more of uh, these propeller structures identified. And so scientists are interested in determining you know, what causes these, uh, the, this material to clump together, get big enough to start affecting the rings around them. It's a very dynamic system, so it could be a, you know, um, it could be that these exist for short periods of time and then at, at some point in time they're disrupted and uh, uh, dissipate. This is Pandora. Pandora orbits uh, just outside of the F ring. You could see uh, it's large enough to uh, uh, have craters on. Uh, in other words, objects have hit uh, Pandora. But, it, but if you look at the texture around it, it's quite smooth. So it looks like it, it's being coated with particles. And, uh, and these particles are likely from the F ring itself, uh, just uh, coating the surface. And you can see some landslides here. It looks like uh, some exposed material. Uh, landslides into the uh, center of the uh, crater. We're close enough to see these ring moons, and this is Pan. So Pan orbits in this uh, gap here, and you could see this ring of material around Pan. So it looks like there's a central core to this moon which has a lot of uh, striations in it, so there's some geologic activity going on there, maybe some uh, tectonic activity. Uh, but you also have this uh, skirt of material which lies in the equatorial plane. So you know that this material has to be material coming from the rings itself. So as Pan is orbiting within this gap, it is gathering material from the surrounding region, forming this skirt. And this is close as we'll ever get to Pan. 
Here's Atlas, which orbits just outside of the A ring. And you can see the big, the, the uh, core, but it has an even bigger skirt of material. So this is uh, at 65 millimeter, uh, meters per pixel. Mm -hmm. Just amazing. So it looks like you have this skirt of material kind of you know, sliding down towards the uh, coating the rest of this core. And here's a comparison of all of them. When, when we uh, released this, uh, <laughs> uh, we got a whole bunch of uh, comments in the Twitterverse uh, saying that, uh, you know, these moons look like ravioli. <laughs> or some, uh, some, some sort of puff pastry uh, or ravioli. Um, <laughs> but you can see the, uh, they're all to scale here. Um, so uh, Pan is slightly smaller than Atlas. Uh, Pan also orbits within the rings, the Enki gap, versus Atlas being outside of the, Enki, uh, outside of the rings. And the reason why uh, Atlas has more material is because it is further from Saturn. There's a competition between these bodies, these moons, and Saturn for uh, uh, which, which determines how much material uh, could coat uh, these rings. So we think that Atlas is as big as it's really going to get. I mean, it's you know could gather more material, but it's really not going to get that much more bigger. Uh, the uh, pan itself is a lot closer to Saturn, and so it can't grow. Uh, much larger than it is now. Daphnis still has time. So uh, onward to the effering, uh, uh, to, um, to the grand finales. So uh, we have all these orbits which take us within this gap. And you might ask yourself, is it safe? You're taking this uh, $3.5 billion spacecraft and flying it through this gap. And you want to know that it's safe to do this. So, so we, this is one of our best uh, images of this region uh, stretched. Uh, and the ring scientists have used uh, images like this to determine how much material is there. Now, if it appears in this picture, either you have a large density of material, or you have objects that are big enough to uh, scatter light. And so uh, they ensured us that, oh, there's you know, very little material there. This is stretching it even further. So this is where we think the edge of the uh, D ring is, this purple line. And this is the zone that Cassini is flying through. So of course you hope that, that the ring scientists are correct and that their images, uh, in their interpretation of the images. And so they ensure us that this is a safe region to be. Uh, these are all our ring plane crossings, our periaps. Um, so we cross the ring plane, but we're still not the, at our closest point to Saturn. Uh, about seven minutes later, we reach our minimum altitudes. Let's turn that over here. So here you could see the, each of those uh, orbits. So we still, you know, this is still ring material. There's stuff here that you don't want to fly through. So we have 22 of these orbits. Roughly every six and a half days we uh, fly through periaps. And these are the altitudes that we're flying at. So in order to protect, <coughs> oh, this is the, uh, what we consider the safe zone. So you could see we still have some orbits that takes us up into the D ring here, where we're expecting a lot more material than there is down in this region. And then this is the atmosphere itself. So of course you want to protect yourself when you uh, are up in this region. And how you protect yourself is that you use the high gain antenna. Basically the antenna that we use to communicate with the Earth, we could use that as a shield. It's a big massive piece of material that could protect us. 
And so uh, uh, if the particles are uh, small enough, they're just going to hit the uh, antenna and bounce off, basically. But you hope that there's no big particles that will puncture through that. <laughs> um, and it go and you, we're going at 77,000 uh, kilometers per second. Uh, that, that's a huge speed, and all it takes is a tiny particle, you know, about a micron in size, to really uh, do damage. So you want to protect yourself, and we chose those four orbits to protect ourselves. And of course, we didn't know what we're, what we're going to be flying through, so we wanted to protect ourselves for the first time uh, through here. So this was our first crossing. You can see us turning the spacecraft to its safe attitude as you go through the rings. And in theory, this should work. So when we were outside of the rings, uh, through going through those ring grazing orbits, this is what we heard with our uh, radio plasma antennas. You could see us coming up on ring plane crossing here because the intensity of particle hits increase. And these are just like little pings hitting the spacecraft. So that's what we heard outside of the rings. This is what we heard interior to the rings. In fact, you can even see the sig a signal from the ring plane crossing here. You'll hear a whistler here. So we literally did not hear any dust hitting the spacecraft uh, as we went through that first gap. And uh, we've been there through there uh, four times, and the past three times, still no sign of the large amount of dust that, uh, that our models were saying should be there, but uh, uh, isn't. And at the same time, we're, take, we're imaging the planet. So uh, 90 degrees away from the high gain antenna is our cameras, and so we're imaging the planet as we come along down. And here's those images, starting at the pole near the hexa near the uh, hurricane, and propagating down. So the images up here are about the size of the U.S. in, in, in uh, projected size. And by the time you get to the equator, they're about the size of the Rose Bowl. Show that again. So when uh, Andy Ingersoll, who uh, I'm sure most of you know, uh, when he was looking at these images that night uh, on the 26th, uh, these words came out of his mouth. I have never seen anything like that. And uh, he was referring to the uh, clouds that were superimposed over the uh, hexagon here. And uh, let's see if I could. Uh... Yeah, just about that. So you see these puffs of white clouds here uh, overlaying the streaks uh, due to the jet stream. Just uh, uh, amazing that you could have these, uh, this convective activity overlaid uh, on this uh, uh, looks like lamellar flow. Um, so here's another close up. I mean, just these are all clouds, storms, convective activity uh, on the planet. We passed over a convective cell there. 
And as you get closer to the equator, you get more and more haze uh, building up in the atmosphere, so it gets less and less uh, distinct. But the imaging team have learned, has learned that they, uh, that they could do a better job now that they have this data in hand. They can make adjustments to their settings. And so our next uh, view of the planet in this manner will be six orbits from now. And uh, they've tweaked their settings to uh, uh, better enhance images uh, near the equator to bring out the contrast. So some of the other interesting science that we're doing, and, and probably are some of our biggest uh, goals of the uh, grand finale orbits, is to learn about the interior of the planet. So we don't know much about uh, the interior, like where does the uh, uh, atmosphere transition from a molecular hydrogen interior to a uh, basically a uh, uh, metallic hydrogen interior. And it's thought that this is where you have all these charged particles, electrons being stripped off from the hydrogen, generating the magnetic field. So we're interested in just how deep is this transition and the gravity will help, uh, help us determine that in addition to the magnetic field measurements. Uh, so with gravity, we hope to understand more about the structure of Saturn itself. And we also hope to learn just how deep do the winds of Saturn blow. Uh, we see, similar to Jupiter, you know, all these uh, uh, jet streams and uh, just how deep do those penetrate into the planet? We'll be able to learn that. Uh, similar to the Juno mission. So there's a lot of synergy uh, between Juno and Cassini in this phase of uh, the mission. And of course, we're interested in the magnetic field because that will tell us just how deep uh, where is, is where the, the dynamo region lies. Where does the magnetic field uh, start uh, where is it generated and where does it, uh, uh, what, what is its field strength? And to this day, we don't know exactly uh, what a, the length of a day on Saturn is. And um, with Jupiter, you have a nice tilt to the magnetic field, and that serves as a, uh, like a lighthouse where you could see the periodic signal, and with that, you could determine that the uh, core must rotate at a certain uh, rate. With Saturn, we don't know that. To, to this day, uh, our best data indicates that the magnetic field is aligned with its pole axis. And uh, if that's the case, well, you don't have anything that will tell you that provides that strobe uh, effect um, uh, to tell you what the length of day is. But since we're close to Saturn now, uh, we're detecting all the higher order moments of the magnetic field. And if there's any asymmetry in those moments, we're going to be able to say uh, what the, uh, what the uh, rotation rate is. So stay tuned for that. In addition uh, to measuring the gravity of Saturn itself, we're going to be measuring the mass of the rings. All this time, we've been outside of the Saturn and rings system. So when we measure gravity uh, with the spacecraft, We've, we're literally measuring Saturn plus rings. Now that we're interior to the rings, we could do the math and basically subtract off the ring mass. And this uh, ring mass is uncertain by uh, at least 100% uh, at this time. So uh, we don't know what the true mass of the rings uh, are. And the mass of the rings is key in understanding the origin of the rings. Uh, if you have a massive ring system, uh, well, that means that you have a lot of material there, and it's taken a, lo a long time for the rings to come into their current configuration. And that would argue for an older ring system. However, if it's less massive than we think, uh, then that would argue for a uh, more recent ring system. And so we hope to put some constraints on here and... Uh, you know, my bet is 1.3 minus masses. Uh, there's uh, <laughs> a poll going on uh, uh, within the project uh, uh, as to uh, how massive uh, the rings are indeed. 
We're also, as we're flying through this region, we're also detecting the, mag the plasma within this region. Now, early on in the mission, uh, we had uh, seen a new radiation belt, uh, which we think uh, originates within uh, this gap. And so scientists are eagerly uh, looking at their data, uh, trying to determine uh, w just what the plasma properties are and how strong this uh, radiation field uh, actually is. So far, it's not strong enough to harm any of the spacecraft. And we'll also learn about the uh, top of the atmosphere. So uh, we're collecting our you know, first ever direct uh, ring composition as we fly through this gap, we have a dust analyzer that could detect the, the dust from the rings, uh, pretty much the ice, the water ice, uh, hitting uh, the dust analyzer. And from that, they could look for minor constituents. Do they see iron, for example? Do they see silica? Those are big questions uh, that the ring scientists need to answer. And so we'll be able to measure these uh, ring particles uh, coming directly from the rings. Highest resolution imaging. Uh, we're doing a lot of radio occultations. So imagine beaming this radio signal through the rings and hearing it on the Earth. Uh, that happened just last week. Uh, uh, we're, in fact, the ring scientists, uh, the quote of the day was, wow, I've never seen so much scattering uh, due to ring particles. Uh, uh, when we're farther out, you don't see a lot of scattering, but when you're closer, uh, that, ring, that radio signal just hits the tiniest of particles and scatter uh, uh, radio signals in all direction, and we detect some of those radio uh, scatterings. We're also, uh, our first active radar pinging of the rings uh, is occurring during this phase, so imagine uh, we've used our radar to detect lakes on, on Titan, and it was designed for that. Uh, but now we're using that radar to literally bounce the radar signal off of the rings. And of course, our highest resolution of imaging of the poles will inform us more about the, uh, the um, aurora, for example, occurring uh, in these regions. And one advantage of, of uh, flying through this region is that you're actually sampling magnetic field lines that actually feed into uh, the auroral zone. For, so for this first time, we'll, we'll detect the inputs uh, of material going into the aurora. And during our final days, uh, we're going to be looking for objects in the rings like Peggy. We've been tracking this object for quite some time. Uh, over the last few years. Uh, we think it's a, a moon that's forming. Uh, uh, it's recently been observed to have broken up into two pieces, though. So who knows if it's going to survive or not. Uh, but, uh, and, and who knows, maybe in, our, uh, in the next five months, we'll see uh, you know, one of these objects just detach itself from the rings. Uh, we're going to be observing uh, Titan for the very last time. We're going to be doing uh, uh, an awesome uh, mosaic we have planned as a goodbye message uh, uh, from uh, Cassini. Uh, we'll be seeing uh, Enceladus uh, setting behind Saturn. We'll be studying these propellers in, um, in, uh, during the last days, too, as we come close to a few of them. And then during the final minutes, we'll be sampling the upper atmosphere of, of Saturn. Uh, you're talking the neutral atmosphere, the ionosphere, the exosphere uh, of the planet. During the last five orbits, you're uh, just skimming the top of the atmosphere. And during the final orbit, you're going through that atmosphere. And of course, uh, we hope that the spacecraft continues uh, to re retain its uh, um, thruster authority and hope that we continue to get a signal as deep as we can. So with that,
That will be our uh, final uh, journey through uh, the atmosphere of uh, Saturn. So this is a cartoon uh, that uh, a person working at JPL published. Um, so here's Saturn talking to Cassini, uh, saying, hey, uh, Cassini, I hear you're retiring. Congrats. How do you want to celebrate? Uh, maybe let's do lunch or something. Nah, I'll just go straight, barreling straight into your atmosphere until I'm crushed to death by, and vaporized by your uh, uh, atmosphere. Of course, Saturn is kind of <laughs> skeptical, <laughs> thinks about it for a while. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'll take questions. Yeah.